When uh, Hermie asked me to talk about our journey with DMM, before I want to tell you kind of how we've tried to implement it, I want to tell you why, um, because there's some value in that journey that brought us here, in my opinion. Um, I was hired at uh, PCC because they wanted to do a better job of making disciples of people in-house. Um, senior pastor, very good evangelist, you know, he just oozes evangelistic gifts, and they've just said, you know, we're better at gathering a crowd than we are at taking them somewhere in a consistent kind of way. And I just said, you know, Gary, I'd, I'd love to help with that, with the small groups and stuff, but I also, I really want to spend some of my time on how do we reach folks outside who aren't coming to church. I'm just been at this long enough to see severe limitations to an attractional model in the culture that we live in right now. And he said, great, let's, let's spread you across that. Um, I got exposed to um, DMM going down to a training at uh, Zanker Road with Hermie. I had done seeker small groups before using kind of the uh, Willow Creek material and all. And I found, they said, if you can get people in the groups, about 80% of them tend to come to some kind of faith. That My experience was the same. I had five guys in the group. Four of them came to Christ. The only guy who didn't, didn't come because he didn't want to stop sleeping with his girlfriend, not because he had problems with Jesus, really. Um, but what I saw as a limitation of that is I couldn't see how you could scale that. The level of sophistication it took to lead one of those groups, it was, first, so I couldn't, they wouldn't go from the group to the church so that I could go out and get another group. So I'm kind of there. And the level of sophistication, it's a problem. You know, it, it took me, who's okay, comfortable with people saying, F and Jesus this and whatnot, and, and can kind of sit with them for a while over this, and not everybody can do that. You know, and being able to create, it's a big process to create people who can do that. And so I was like, man, there's got to be something that's a little more scalable than this. Not that are four people worth two years of my life, of course they are but there's an awful lot of people who aren't getting touched by that. Um, and I don't, one of the things I saw from, who's the big guy from India? What's his name again? David Watson. David Watson. He's a big, big mind. And one of the things that he showed at a, at a uh, conference I was attending, he drew the, an X, Y axis. And you, you've seen these where you, you're, whatever you're charting, it kind of goes to infinity up in that direction infinity out in this direction. Um, and he was saying, this is the skills and resources required to pull off a different, a, a certain strategy of reaching out to people. And this is the, um, this is the body of Christ. And if you look at um, any, if you look at John Ortberg's job, he's way up here. You got to be able to preach like Billy Graham. You got to be able to manage like a Fortune 500, and you got to have a heart like Mother Teresa. There just aren't that many people who can do that. And then you say, how much is the land that that church is sitting on? How much does it cost? Just the it, so he called these strategies high arm strategies. Um, and DMM is what you call a long arm strategy. The percentage of the body of Christ who can actually pull off the skills that are involved is very, very high. The financial resources that are required, very, very low. So I'm, you know, we, we may get into this thing further and say, you know what, we're about 50% right on how DMM plays with the up and outs by just taking what's worked in Africa and India over here, and we've got to do 50% <coughs> tweak on it to merely make it hum here. But I think we're in the right vineyard that something that's a long-arm strategy is got, that gets the larger body of Christ into the game. Yeah. Is, that's, to me... What we've got to do, and if you consider going even further and say, now let's put the, that only, what is it, 5 to 10% of the Bay Area 
will go to church, then, um, what am I, what did I lose? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then this high arm strategy, it can only reach five to 10% of the population. So if you put the rest of the, you know, the population of the, of the bay on this chart here, they're completely off the table for this high arm strategy alone. I'm not, I'm not against church, bricks and mortar, any of that. I'm just saying we've got to use our high arm ministries like PCC, like this church, like Menlo to resource and equip people to do long arm stuff. Or 85% of the people are off the table from the get go and we just, we need to stop talking about the Great Commission because they're not even on the table anyway. So it was questions like that that made DMM really appeal to me because it, I'm not, you know, they say, what is it, 5% of the body of Christ has a spiritual gift of evangelism. I'm not one of those. I'm one of the 95%. I'm passionate about it, but I'm not wired. I'm not like Gary. So I'm also biased towards any approach that I think normal people can pull off. Um, and, you know, honestly, I got into DMM right after a three-year medical leave, after a bike wreck where I broke my neck in two places, brain trauma, three-year recovery period. And I'm like, at, at, at my worst, at my lowest points, I'm like, Jesus, if, you know, it was taking a while to get my faculties back and concentration span. My capability is as high as it was before. My capacity in terms of the number of hours I can play my A game is different now. And it was like, Jesus, if all I'm qualified to be after that accident is a Walmart greeter for Jesus, why didn't you just take me home? Because mm -hmm. at least my family could have had life insurance. Mm -hmm. And I went into this training and I'm kind of like, you know, all this needs is a Walmart greeter for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that brings an awful lot of people back into the game. Um, and if it's not DMM, then it's got to be something kind of like it. So we'll start. That's where I want to start. Um, so uh, I started talking to Jan. So I've, but I've got these two things going. I've got this, how do we reach out to the larger group of people? Also, I've been paid to disciple folks at PCC. So I got to looking at this the DBS component, the Discovery Bible Study, saying, man, that is an extremely rich spiritual discipline. I, I began doing it myself after I got exposed to the training, saying, I'm not going to feed the flock something if it doesn't nourish me. So I'm like, man, this is as good as anything I've done in a long, long time for my own spiritual growth. Because of its word, it's, there's obedience, there's sharing it with other people, there's all of these things. And so I Took, took it to our staff and said, guys, I really think this may be the horse we want to ride internally for our discipleship here, both because I think it's effective and because our people would be learning one skill set that they can use to grow in Christ and to help others grow to Christ. Because so I'm like, I'm not convinced that our people, as smart and sophisticated as they are, they have enough mind share to learn one complicated system to grow in Christ and then another complicated system to help their friends come to Christ. Let's see if we can line up two or three of these dominoes, fire one bullet that go through all of them. And so I had our staff go through it for the summer saying, guys, if you come back in the fall and you're dry as a bone, then let's just close the book on that experiment. But they're coming back saying, this is good. This is making us grow. And Jan uh, Winters, who shared last time, she said, you know, if I had it to, to do over again, I would drip this stuff in on the discipleship side first. She said, my experience was it was too big of a jump for people to go from not engaged in evangelism at all to leading uh, discovery groups for people. You know, just, there's got to be something in between. So she said, I would drip it in over here. So that was the strategy that we went with. And so we began putting together uh, for our congregation, these Discovery Bible journals that go with our preaching series. So, uh, when we we're in a, we're in the Gospel of John right now, and that's the one that we're currently using, and it, we've put these together both for individual a life alone with God, and for 
small groups. Now, not all of our small groups are using them, but probably 50% of our small groups have adopted this. Um, and so our people are getting facility with this, of how these tools work. You know, I, and we told people, guys, do this with your families around the dinner table. You know, we, we've got a, 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 out of every message, we pull out one or two verses that you can use for family devotions. So we, we do family church at our house on Sunday nights, and we just take one, or, one verse, and we don't pull out paper and write it down, but it's just, hey kids, here's, here's something that we've been studying in church. What do, you, what do you think that means? And what do you think God wants you to do with it? And how can we pray for each other? But it puts pastoring your family, it puts the cookies for that on the bottom shelf that normal moms and dads can do. And it was funny, the first time I did it, with my family, I got a call from church that I had to take. And so I'm like, oh shoot, I gotta get up and leave. And I turned to my, that time, 14 year old daughter and said, honey, I, I gotta leave, can you lead the rest of it? She said, sure, I get it. And she's been exposed to it for five minutes and she's saying, I get it, I know how this works. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's worth noting. Um, so anyway, we're, this is our fourth one that we've uh, put out, our first time out of a worshiping congregation of about 850, we had 900 of them taken. Now we're settled in about five or 600 a pot. Now that doesn't tell you exactly how many are really putting a lot of elbow grease into it, but it is, you know, it, it is increasing as we go along. So, um, and what we're working on with that as well is some more topical stuff. That, I think there's some limitations to always having it match your, um, your sermon stuff because there's not like a beginning, there's not like a sequential step to help somebody grow um, where if you're, let's say, Mark, you're in the church and, and you've got somebody that you want to mentor in the faith, you, you may want something that's a little more sequential, you know, first steps with God topical, how do you, prayer, whatnot, but we uh, came up, or are producing these, which are, let me keep one of them, yeah. but where we're coming up with passage strings for, I mean, this first one that's spelled out here is kind of early Christian life, the one that we're developing right now, um, but first steps with God, passages that go along, so you, you just kind of apply the same type, the three-column approach to these different passages, you can deliver a lot of different, it's a delivery system for a lot of different kinds of content. Um, and so we're putting together some of those in-house, but we're also going to liberally steal from what's already out there. Um, on this back page, this is something that's already been put together by somebody else, where it's like three passage topics, three passage strings on each of these topics. So the churches that have been doing this longer than we have, and it's become more part of the muscle memory of people, they'll go, people come in and say, hey, my marriage stinks. Is this from Nashville or Kansas City? I don't know. Where is that from? That's from Dallas. Yeah. From Dallas? Yeah. Anyone know the URL? It looks like there's a link. Yeah. I, can, I can send, uh, I can just, I was just planning on emailing that out to all oh, of you okay. so that you can steal the same stuff that we're stealing. Um, but the churches that have done this, what they say, they've done it a little bit longer, they say people start getting used to it, and they're like, I don't know how to, what, how to handle my money well, can I get the passage string about money? My marriage stinks, can I get the passage string on marriage? So they start learning to drive a Bible to solve real life issues. Um, so that's what we're doing um, in-house, and we did that in-house, pretty exclusively in-house in 2014 and 2015, we started dripping in the DMM, which is the using this to help friends come to Christ and people. Um, so we've done two and a half trainings so far in our congregation. The first two, we had 25-ish people each one. Um, the one we're doing now, we've got 10 coming, um, and I'm not sure if that's because in the Wednesday night time slot, we've kind of picked the low-hanging fruit that can make that time work already, 
but I'm also we're we're paying attention to it because I'm not so sure, but whether the this DMM training works better as a micro brew than as a Bud Light vat. Um, so we're going to kind of assess at the end. I think these people are going to belong to each other more. I mean, you get the same content, but the relational, the biggest issue that we have had is how do you support these people afterwards in a way that actually helps them not just get some content about disciple making, but become disciple makers. And I am... After training or after they've just gone through this a few times? So after the training for DMM. So that, folks who got that don't, they haven't been taught yeah. necessarily how to use this to help friends come to Christ. Yeah. Um, but we, the, we call it iDisciple training, which I think we stole that from you guys. Isn't that what you call it? Team, yeah. yeah, from City Team. And... Um, we, uh, but that, that's pr the biggest thing I'm going to have you guys brainstorm with me is how do you, well, I'll, I'll get there, I'll get there. Um, in doing the training, here's some of the potholes that we have encountered. Um, the first is when it's done in a leader's environment, like it was when I went to Zanker Road, you're cherry picking the incarnational mission-minded people from around the Bay Area and they're, they're self-selecting into that. It's people like you and me who think about how to, who even think about the 85%, who are thinking how do you, how do you win countries, this, that. I mean, I was weaned in ministry in Africa as a missionary. You, 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 you're asking a different kind of question. In our parish, probably not that different from most people aren't asking those same questions at that same level. Um, and so when Hermie and I first started doing the training, we, I think we lost some people because we were steering so fast and hard into this, this global application of it. Um, a lot of these folks, they're really, in a, in a local church, they're, can God use me to win anybody? And how might that happen? That first cup. That's where they're real, to get them that far would be a huge win with vision for where it goes from there. But that's, even in the current training Hermie and I are doing, we're kind of wrestling with how much of this do you put as part of the training versus how much of it belongs in the coaching and mentoring afterwards. You know, for example, if Rob comes to the training and he's got somebody who is leaning into Christ and maybe open to their friend, he's going to be beating the path down to my door to say, how the heck do I do this um, at that point? So we're, I think we've prob we're still not regulated on that, in my, is my suspicion. I think we're still a little too geared towards mission leaders and whatnot and need to get it more towards getting our people going. Um, another pothole uh, is um, that people come into the class they really want a can opener to win a specific person that they have in their life. So they're, th they're thinking, that husband of mine is a rascal and he needs to meet Jesus and you're going to give me the magic incantation that's going to make it happen. Or the, the right, you know, you give me the two or three questions that are going to do it. Or somebody else comes in, and there's this guy in the cube next to me who works with me at Google and he's, you're going to give me the magic can opener. And to help them see, guys, we're actually asking you to, to look at this process the reverse of that. I shared with our folks last uh, week ago that um, when I became a Christian, I wanted my dad to know Christ. You know, he grew up, I would say agnostic, not hostile, but just, I wish I could believe what you believe. And I started praying for him. I prayed 25 years for my dad. And he, at age 76, he did accept the Lord and knew him. So praise God for that. Um, I never found a magic can opener, but God used the little fumbling, bumbling over the years. But I was saying, as one of those 95 percenters who don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism, I said, let me contrast that with my relationship with Bill. Bill drove past our church for years and years on his way to go running in the Stanford Hills. This was, this is a guy, I'm just giving you an example out of 
my time in Menlo, but, and he said, I never came in because I knew this would just be a bunch of blue-haired little old ladies and have nothing to do with me, but I came in this morning and you're up there preaching about, going, about how you like to go run in the Stanford Hills. And he said, well, but I said, well, Bill, let's go run together. But my prayer life for about a year before that has been, Lord, I'm not Billy Graham, I'm not Gary Gadini, but will you bring me somebody who needs to hear about you the way I can share you? Give me a nice slow pitch right over home plate, but play t-ball with me. Because I bring me somebody who, for whom Hermie would be a turnoff, you'd be a turnoff, Billy Graham would be a turnoff, but for whatever reason. And so I said, I'm just going to pray that until he does it. I'm, I'm the slow part of the class. So Bill and I go running up in the Stanford Hills. It is immediately apparent to me this guy is brilliant. He's like C.S. Lewis. He's, there's no way I can get in and spar with him. And, but he's saying, you know, I've tried the Hindu religious system. I moved to India to follow Mah, Maha somebody. And I've tried the Muslim religious system and on and on. And I just said, you know, Bill, the only thing I can tell you is at the heart of Christianity, there is no system. There's just a person named Jesus that you can know and be known by and love and be loved by. And he just stopped. Like somebody had slammed him in the chest with a sledgehammer. And he just said, if that's true, that's different than everything I've ever looked at. And in a month, he's a Christian. In a couple of years, he's taking classes at Fuller, and he's an elder at Menlo. But the, the number of ripples out in Bill's life, not just in his own life, but the number of other people who found Christ. I'm just saying, guys, you need to, you're going to reverse the way you're praying if you go through this class. You're going to be saying that John 6:44 of no one comes to the comes to me unless the Father draws them, you're going to start looking for who is God drawing and connect me with that person. So we started coming up with verbiage to help people get this. You know, like in, if you've ever raised tomatoes, you've got a tomato plant in your garden, and you go out, and they're never all ripe at the same time. You know, you've got two red ones and 18 green ones. You don't rip off the green ones and throw them in the trash, but the only ones you pick today are the red ones. You know, my, my dad was a green tomato for 25 years, but because I was so zeroed in on him, I wonder how many red ones I walked right by because I wasn't opening myself that way. And, and so we're basically, I would say 100% of the folks who go, ah, I can't say that. A high percentage of the people who go through our training, they pray very differently. You know, some of them are actively trying to live into this, some of them are not as active, but what they pray for is different. Um, but So the, the can opener versus letting God flip in the equation around, say, God, bring me somebody that you're already drawing. Yeah, I'm going to pray for my dad. I'm going to pray for my wife or whoever it is. But help, help me start looking for those bright red tomatoes who need you the way I can and, and bring me somebody who, can, who actually needs to hear about you the way I can share. Um, Another pothole is that the, the arrow flows differently than most other programs in this. Pro, uh, Purpose Driven Life, developed in Orange County. Everybody adopts it and does the big program in their church. Let's take it over to Africa. Let's take it over to India. This developed backwards of that. This came from India into Africa, then to relationally based cultures here. And now we're trying to use it with the up and out, saying, does this play in this environment? But some of the things you got, I find you got to nuance some of the way you're presenting this stuff for our people to take it in. Um, some of the specific spots um, that I've found that, the first I've already mentioned, but the, the, um, we're going to reach the whole world with this. Folks, here, they're so disheartened by perceived hardness of the soil that they're like, I don't think I can even reach one. So you got to help them get, get started. Um, we had to do, we chose to do a uh, thing on the art of neighboring over the summer, just saying, you know, our, our people don't even know non-Christians, a lot of them. So we've got to get them... No, we actually did the book that uh, Q Place has put out. Mm -hmm. So we chose the title of the guy who wrote the book, but we 
But we said we got to kind of ameliorate the soil a little bit because our folks, you know, they're not praying for folks. They're not really, they don't have them in their lives. Um, the whole obedience focus, a lot of our folks are like, hey, I've been spending 20 years learning about grace. And now you're telling me it's too much emphasis on grace in the church. We need to be more in obedience. And so helping them see, guys, we're talking about application. We're not trying to send you back 15 years in your spiritual development. But we're talking about application and how not just is it true, but does it work? You know, and until you apply this, what the Bible says about your, how you should treat your wife, you don't even know if it works. Um, and the person of peace concept as well is one that people can get stuck on when we've done the training here because they're, they're like, well, if you know, Sue at work is responsive and has a soft heart to this, but I can't see how Sue is hardwired into all the relationships and the nerve center. Do I just, you know, mark Sue off and just say, well, it's okay for Sue to go to hell. You know, and we're having... So anyway, we've had to work with that a little bit. I felt a little bit, you know, when we were at the online training thing, I felt a little bit of pushback from some of the, not you, because you, but some of the coworkers of, hey, you can't change anything. So, but helping the folks who've done it in a missionary context be willing to enculturate it in this context. So I think there's a little bit of missionary work to be done there. Um, the, okay, so let me see. Some questions it's left me with. One is, um, well, let me, let me give you some sense. So we've had... 60 people go through this training, if you count the group that we're in, we're with now. Um, I would say of those, I'll put down some numbers here. Not where I put them, but I would say out of the 60, probably 15 or so are really leaning into it. Probably 20 or 30 are praying substantially different. Five probably have real persons of peace that they are working with, and one of them is trying to start a discovery group. So, is it, have we cracked the code on this? No, but it's moving. The ball's moving, and, I, and you're, getting, you're getting people moving who, if you told them to do the stuff that I grew up with, of evangelism explosion and all that, they would laugh you out of the room. And these people are getting in the, into the game. Um, the uh, top three challenges, um, and I, I, I can give you more than I can give you more than three. Um, but the biggest one for me is how to support the people that have gone through the training so that they actually implement this stuff. I mean, Hermie, you were talking about there's a perspective percentage that you guys have gotten used to of when you've done the trainings in different places, how many of those folks actually, kind of left to their own devices, actually go out and become disciple makers. It's not as high as you'd like it to be. So we're all, if you're doing it in a parish environment, it's how do you support very, very busy people? Um, and so that and I guess related to that is how much, do you tr how much of the goods do you try and deliver in your training versus how much do you try and deliver in the supportive relationships after? Because we probably historically have spent maybe half of our time on the... So we kind of uh, boiled this down to there's really four, four movements that we're trying to help people get skills for and um, believe God for. There's the movement of that, that individual person believing that God can use me in this. There's the movement from that to this person finding a person of peace. Somebody that they're actually, that got somebody that God is drawing 
and seeing that person's heart changed. Then from person of peace, leading a discovery group. From discovery group to movement. And probably our training, even the last time we did it, was 25, 25, 25, 25. And I'm wondering if it should really be more. 80% with a forecast of let us show you where this can go. Um, And then if you get here, you're going to be extremely motivated for the next steps. Yeah, that's, that's, and then how do you do it? Is it, yeah, and so maybe there's a 2.0, but that's, that is a piece for me. Um, I would say another challenge for us, for me, is our church, probably like a lot of our churches who grew up, in the shadow of Willow Creek and whatnot, we're really schizophrenic about attractional versus deployment. Because this is a deployment strategy. But we're working really hard to do our attractional stuff that happens on Sunday. And so, even with my own time and mind share, you know, and I'm not calling the shots. And if I had your job, Joel, I don't know that I'd have time to implement this. So I'm not saying I want to be calling the shots, I don't. I, I love being able to focus here. But, you know, I, a lot of leadership in our church has microwave tastes and a crockpot business. Mm-hmm. This is a crockpot process mm-hmm. that you got to sustain with. And, but a lot of the, the flashy, what are we going to do in the fall that's splashy and big and whatnot, it comes out of that other set of muscle memory. It comes out of the the attractional, heavy, um, yeah, it's, it's high arm and it's attractional. What percentage of, of your staff time is spent on attractional stuff? Very high. So like 75% of your energy? Maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, no, let's say around 75. But so I, and I don't think that totally matches our values. I just think you're, you're driving a car down the road 70 miles an hour and it takes an yeah. awful lot of care and feeding to keep it going totally. and you're trying to redesign it at the same time without, and you can't take it to the shop for six months and just shut everything down. Um, so that is, a, that is another um, piece of this. It was funny, sitting out in front of uh, the building before you guys got here, Rob was in a meeting. But anyway, the group who are here for, what's the name of the? Downtown Street Team. Downtown Street Team. So these, these are folks who are primarily low income, at or near homelessness. And I was watching those folks, and I was there for five minutes, and I knew who the person of peace was. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I didn't know how soft his heart was to the gospel, but I kind of thought it was, because he's, Oh, you're blessed, man. You, wanna, you found some money. Don't use that for bad things. Use it for good. Don't use it for, you know. But he knew everybody by name. I was saying, if you threw me into that same number of people, 20, 20 people with my congregation and asked me to show you who the person of peace is, it would take an awful lot longer to figure out you know, who is that person who's kind of Maybe centrally walking. Maybe. <laughs> but it just runs slower. It runs slower. Um, and, you know, there's a guy, Giovanni, who's in one of my men's groups, and he was sharing that he and his wife were estranged for two years. They came back together, and 110 members of his family came to Christ mm-hmm. out of that. Yeah, huge. And you do it, you know, if that happened to, no, to Rob and his wife, folks would go, that's, that's good, good on you. Good for you. Good for you. Italian or Palestinian? Uh, no, uh, Hispanic. Yeah, yeah. So, all that to say, I, so a couple other questions. This, now I'm getting more philosophical here. But, um, 
I have at times, one, here's the range of questions I've wondered. At, at times, I went into this whole thing saying DMM is evaluated good or, as functional or not based on how well it will work with up and outs. And I said, well, is that really biblical? Because Jesus said, go and find the most receptive folks and go with them. So should all of us just be spending all of our time with the down and outs? Um, and I said, no, well, the Holy Spirit's got to lead in that because you can't make a hard and fast rule. But then I also said, you know what? Is there any If we're evaluating this as to whether this works or not based on how fast it's going, show me anything that's fast with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler is served pretty well by the status quo. Mm -hmm. Those folks in the next room, not so much. So I, I don't know, it's just questions I'm asking. And I'm also, you know, the people, in, David Watson, another guy we met with from India, they scratched, clawed, prayed for decades. Yeah. And God, give us a way to reach these people. So the gestation period was long. And then when it happened, you know, it goes really fast. But so are we in the gestation period where we've, you know, we've kind of got to be butting our heads against processes that are long arm and, and try and find what's going to go. But don't, don't be so quick. I don't want to be quick to throw things out because they aren't explosive mm -hmm. on the front end. What, is, what has been explosive with this group of people? Okay, that's going to take God. So anyway, guys, that's my... Yeah. Those are some of my thoughts and some of our experience. Um, a couple other little resources I'll give you um, that these are just odds and ends, but... Uh, I don't know who we, every, every good thing we've got, we stole from somebody. Um, and we steal a little bit from them. Yeah. But this is, um, this is the creation to Christ stuff that, um, that our folks are, when, they're, when God is bringing them somebody, this is kind of what they're using. They may, let's say Joel is, I meet Joel and I sense he's soft. If Joel is really freaked out about, the way, the way his marriage is going, I may start with, hey, Joel, let's, let's look at what the Bible has to say about how husbands treat their wives. Yeah. I, don't, I don't say, hey, Joel, you've got to start with Genesis. But if, if there is receptivity there, then pretty soon we'll bend back around to yeah. this. So you start where they are, but then you've got, just because people don't have an Old Testament, in their ROM or RAM or anything. It's not in there anymore. Yeah. So Jesus, is, Jesus saves from sin. What sin? Mm -hmm. um, and then the process questions are on the back of kind of how you do that individually or with a group of people. And, yeah. and so whatever passages of Scripture you're dealing with, you, you run them through the same process every time. So it's, it's long arm in that way that you don't have to... In, in fact, people who go to seminary tend to ruin this. Because I'll say, well, you know, in Hebrew, actually, what this meant, and, you know, then I'd tell you about all of this, and then Joel's going to go, dang, if you've got to know that, yeah. I'm not going to talk anymore. Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing. You can take as many as you want. Yeah. Um, and th this one is... What, when I wanted to evaluate it for myself, is this beneficial? I use this one, this set of passage strings called Emerging Leaders, mm -hmm. but it could be beneficial if there are people you're mentoring or something like that, or you just want to see for, your own, for yourself, yeah. um, is this beneficial? Um, oh, I'll tell you, in-house, one other thing that's a challenge, you will have to work hard and really lean against the tiller to get people to do to do that third column. Yeah. The, that, what will I do? Who what? Will I tell? Yeah. Wh how do I obey this, and who will I tell? Um, they'll they will say, "Well, I want to." It's a passage on prayer. I want to be a more prayerful person. It's a passage on on how you love your wife. I want to be a better husband. And I, and I'm like, guys, that's a that's a forty year goal. Yeah. 
You used to be working on that one when the heart monitor's flat for at least eight minutes. Break that down into something you can do or not do between now and the next meeting. So I was saying, guys, so that, that whole wall there, that's become a better husband. I want you to find one brick that you can lay this week. And so, you know, I give me the example. I say, you know, I read the one about hus husbands love your wives, and, and I had been, Hermie had leaned against the tiller for me. And so I said, okay, you know what? I look at the calendar. I haven't taken my wife out for a date in six weeks. So I'm going to plan a date night for us for each week from now till we go on vacation. And then I go and I tell my wife about it. and She starts crying because she feels loved. And I come back and I feel like this stuff actually works. So I want to obey it the next time. And so you're really having to, to lean into that. Um, and the who do I know who would benefit from hearing this that I can share it with, that'll be the hardest thing for you to get your people to do. But if, if they do it, that's where a lot of the magic happens. Um, so. Can you talk about the third struggle? Mm. One second. I've got your other two. Well, get, me, get me started. I'm not even sure I was very disciplined. Are, in... how, how do you Why? support those who are... Who are... That's my biggest one, is how you... And then attractional versus deployment was number two. You, you had also said how much time can people commit to the training? I don't know that I... How much do you share in training and how much do you share afterwards with part of that? Yeah. Was that... I think I kind of had just had two, really. Maybe I had a third thing, oh, okay. I don't know. Separate one into, into two parts and then you get... I wrote yeah, it's... Yeah, but that, that's, that pastoral ADD, I find, is because really, this is going to have to run for long. And when I was a senior pastor, I had it. Because mm -hmm. you've got so many things coming at you from so many different directions. Yeah. But to say, hey, Gary, hey, Joel, this is going to take five years to really see this permeate your congregation, yeah. to see it really start bearing fruit, to where you, if you want the 85% in the game, you need to start thinking. Share the stories as they're happening, mm -hmm. but it's going to take a while. Ben, can you just briefly also share uh, the 80 versus 20? Um, we've made some false assumptions of people uh, attending the training. Yeah. And then also, what are some of the really practical bricklaying things? Can you name those? We had to help them, like, like actually praying, uh, hearing, uh, some of those yeah, things. Yeah, so we're just, like, just the yeah. Very basic things. So places where we left people in potholes, just because we were making big leaps, is ask God to reveal to you, you know, who, who the people are in, where you live, work, and play. We're assuming that they're praying. We're assuming that they can hear God, that they have some faculty. We did a survey of our leaders a couple of years back, and we found out that the women pray. Mm -hmm. The men are not praying. Yeah. Men don't pray and they don't sing. Yeah. So there's a, it's a problem. Yeah. Um, Hermie, help me with some of the other ones. Where did yeah, we... I mean, you had this one group that went through, and actually in the coaching, you discover that that was a ha. No, that was in the co Yeah, so they went through four weeks of the training, and this was a group of, uh, it was a women's small group. They all came together, which was great. But they all came together and they said, hey, can you come? Some of us missed a session. Can you just come to our small group meeting? So I came. And I'm kind of going back and said, well, let me just you know, refresh your memory with a couple of things. And this, the leader of the small group comes out and says, wait a minute, I just got it. This isn't about a can opener for my new age lady next to me on the Stairmaster. This is, you're actually asking God to bring you, who is he drawing right now? You know, and I thought she had that week one. So we've started really hammering. The, the other one was also, be, just because your small groups are using the discovery process, don't assume that everyone really kind of like knows. Yeah, we had to go back and spend a lot more time on doing just, just doing discovery Bible study. Yeah. So delivering more of our content through, let's do this study together. In the training time. In the training time. Because yeah. we just assume since we make these, they know exactly why. They're structured the way they are, what's all baked yeah. in. Yeah. 
Not true. Yeah. Joel. That was kind of my question is on, in your training, do you, do you train using this process or do you just train on the process? We do a little of both, but we, we probably, to a heavy degree, we train on the process, but we do, when we've got passages of scripture, we're trying to have them we, dig into it so that the they're... Discovery, but we don't necessarily how to facilitate discovery groups. We kind of assume people didn't know that, although one session was that discovery group, that one quarter was, was to that. But uh, I think, you know, we used to also do the trainings a lot longer, so we compress kind of like a 20-hour training down to about 10, 12 hours. So uh, you just don't have the time, so... Uh, which is also an up and out challenge. Yeah. Granted, then you have to, somewhere else, you got to really model for people and coach them. So but I think we didn't do it enough in our first two trainings where we're actually having them do this. We're telling about it and why it makes sense yeah, to do it, but we're not actually doing it as much. Um, why I want people to discover all of these truths, and because we're taught in a different way, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, people have a hard time seeing it a little bit differently. Um, some, of, yeah. some of these passages, you have to kind of challenge them to really look at what the passage says. You know, so it takes some time to allow them to discover it. One thing that, that I have tried, and I think I'm going to go back to it kind of as a permanent thing. So I, we had this dead half hour in between services. So I just said, OK, 